All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another installment of the Nashville Grotto Survey Talk. This evening, we're going to have a presentation by Ben Miller uh, on mapping pits and vertical caves. And so tonight, we're just going to go ahead and turn it over and get right to it. So Ben, thanks for joining us, and it's all yours, man. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. All right, folks. Well, yeah, I'm going to be talking about uh, how to map pits. And this is something I've been doing for a few years. And just so that you know, I have a very specific way that I map pits. This will not work for all pits. This will not work for all caves or anything like that. But here in TAG, this technique has worked out very well for us. And we've been able to map lots and lots of pits using these techniques. And I at least want to pass some of this along because I think some people sort of feel intimidated mapping deep pits sometimes, especially when they think about sketching on rope and things like that. And so I'm hoping that with this talk, maybe people will sort of have at least the idea of how we went about this and might be able to, to go out and map pits. Um, you know, as, as with most talks, uh, let's see here. Oh, come on, let's advance. There we go. Uh, we're going to kind of, you know, tell you what we're going to tell you. Uh, and so I'm going to kind of go over how did I sort of develop uh, this style of pit mapping, uh, which started in the Ozarks and then I moved over here to TAG and, and started uh, what we call deep ass, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about. And then just some of our pit surveying methods, uh, how we map these deeper pits, you know, and by deeper pits, I mean pits over 100 feet. Now, of course, as soon as you go internationally, a 100 foot deep pit is nothing. <laughs> so, uh, you know, like I said, these don't work for everything. Survey is very situation dependent. Uh, Sketching considerations, how to sketch profiles, how to sketch plans, and then uh, kind of the, the back end of the talk is going to be to what I call the bells and whistles of pit maps, the different ways we can show different things and, and think, things to think about if you're going to go out and map pits, what are some things that maybe I should try to include on that. Um, so I'm, I'm originally from the Ozarks. Uh, I grew up in southwestern Missouri, started caving in northwestern Arkansas as a, as a child, and through my teenage years up into my 20s, and uh, this is where I really fell in love with caves, with cave mapping and things like that. Um, and believe it or not, you know, there are pits in the Ozarks. Most people don't hear about these because uh, the Ozarks tends to keep things pretty close to the vest, especially once you cross the line into Arkansas. But uh, the very first pit that was uh, of a significant depth that we ever mapped was Ozark Adventure Pit. And uh, my buddy Aaron Souls, who's down here in the lower left-hand corner was who introduced me to this pit. It's a 148-foot deep pit. It has a very small entrance uh, to get into the pit, and then it bells out right away. And we went to this pit for years, just balancing it. Uh, there's another 170-foot uh, surface rappel right next to it. And so we would go and kind of do this double thing. And then eventually I started asking about whether this was mapped or not once we started mapping caves and was kind of shocked to find out it wasn't. And so we started mapping it and uh, produced our very first uh, pit map, which uh, this, is the, this is the map that we drew. And you can see it's kind of got some similarities to some of the tag pits uh, that we've gone on to map, uh, but it's, it's a little rougher around the edges. We hadn't quite figured out our, our methods yet for how to do this, but we were kind of just figuring it out as we went. We kind of took what we knew from mapping normal caves and sort of just applied it to, to mapping pits. Uh, of course, the Ozarks is well known for, for its mud. Uh, and as we went along, we just kind of kept uh, refining our techniques. And so this is a big pit that we discovered in southwestern Missouri. Uh, ended up being about 120 feet deep or so. But you can see on this one, we really tried to show the geology of this because this was formed in two different rock types, uh, one being the very churdy reed spring formation and then the lower bit being the Pearson formation. Uh, and so... Was there a question? Oh, okay. uh, and, and yeah, and the Ozarks do have challenges. This is actually a, a near 100 foot pit uh, that we mapped again down in southwestern Missouri. Had a 10 inch squeeze on rope that had to be done, uh, usually with your rack on your cow's tail as you went down and then taking off your crawl in the little ante room up here before you went back through that squeeze. But then eventually I, I went to grad school in Kentucky and it was there that I started inquiring about some of these pits that we had done years earlier. Years earlier, uh, my buddy Bob Lurch, his son Andy, uh, Roger Brown and I had done several trips over here to TAG to 
could just bounce pits, see the big caves, just kind of experience tag and get to do some rope work. And we we're always just, you know, when we come over, you'd always just be thinking about like, what are all the other caves that are out there? And eventually when I got over here, I started getting access to bits and pieces of that data. And one of these that I was shocked to find out about that was not mapped was Ferris Pit. Now, some of you who maybe have started caving recently may not be familiar with Ferris Pit, but Ferris Pit was, and I would say still is, a tag classic. It was a 252-foot deep pit outside of Cookville. Um, owner was extraordinarily friendly. Uh, you used to be able to drive almost all the way up to the pit. You could, in fact, rig off of your uh, axle on your, on your uh, vehicle uh, to drop into the pit there. And we had found out that this was an unmapped pit. So just like Ozark Adventure Pit, we we're like, wow, we should just go do uh, one of these. And so we went down there armed with sort of our techniques. And uh, we had Mike Costello and Cody Mundy and Leanne Bledsoe. And then Clint Barber's taking the photo. I think I'm either down in the pit or getting ready to get down in the pit here. And this was the map that we produced. And um, again, you can see, you know, we're sort of starting to merge some of this, starting to show a little bit more of the geology up here because this is a Hartzell Mon Eagle cave. And so about the first 20 feet or so is actually in sandstone before you break into the Mon Eagle limestone. And then you have this nice, beautiful, big pit. Um, and we also started experimenting with, with what I call the plan views, which is what these are on the side. Some people might consider these sort of cross sections of the pit if you were to slice the pit kind of looking down the pit kind of thing. Uh, but they actually end up being plan views because they are bird's eye views. But this was the first of many that we would go on to map. And so basically at that point, I was not a TCS member yet. So I would just email Gerald Money and say, what are some more big pits or deep pits in the Cookville area that don't have maps that we have access to or uh, that we know the owner on or things like this, which actually worked out in a lot of ways because these were big pits that people wanted to go bounce. Uh, people knew who the owner was, where you parked, all that kind of stuff. So it made it really easy. Additionally, because these were sort of tag classics, we weren't really stepping on anybody's toes in terms of we weren't taking over somebody's project or something like that. And so through this, we formed a group that, that we called DFAS. And this was a little bit of a tongue in cheek thing because uh, TAG loves acronyms. Uh, there's been these over the years, there was the ACEs, there was the SPADES, there's all these different ones. And so we sort of tongue in cheek called ourselves DFAS, which was D squad. Uh, or uh, really more likely the uh, Deadly Projectile Avoidance Squad. Um, and our, really our goal was really just to map as many of the unsurveyed deep pits in the state as possible and maybe dip our toe into Alabama or Georgia if we had time and we could get access to data. Um, but this is what we did for, for about five to six years nonstop, almost three weekends a month or something like that. And so today we've surveyed approximately 86 pits that are over 100 feet deep. I say approximately, I tried to go through this the other night because I had not updated the number since 2014. And so as far as I can tell, that's it. But we've mapped a lot of caves and mapped a lot of other, other pits along the way and, and gone into other states around the area. So, but this was kind of uh, our group. Uh, this, is a, this is a group of all of the uh, uh, participants that I could think of. If your name is missing from here, I apologize. Uh, but this was, again, this was an old list that I kind of tried to add names to that I could think of who had helped us since I had initially created this list. But you can see there's a lot of people from a lot of different grottos. So this was not just Ben Miller goes and maps the pits. This was a group effort. This is a we that, that, that did this. Uh, and this is kind of a, a, uh, a list of the, the off the hand pits that I could think of that we had mapped. Uh, you can see very strongly a lot in Putnam County. Uh, a lot of Marion County, where we had a lot of help from Jason Hardy and Kelly Smallwood. And then we've gone into a whole bunch of other counties and even gone in, down into Alabama and done a number of, of caves and even mapped two, two pits and, and cave systems down in Georgia. And so uh, we really got kind of obsessed with this for a while and, and, and just, uh, just were having a blast with it. So kind of moving on to how did we do all this? Um, this is the gear, and, and cavers love gear. We love to talk about gear. This is my only gear slide, really. Uh, but this will just kind of give you an idea. The, the key to, to uh, how we did this is you can see those tapes there. And for those of you that are disto surveyors, you're going, what in the hell are those? Well, those are the backbone of our survey. 
uh, because if you use a disto, you have no frame of reference while you're hanging on rope for where your drop shot was and for how far you are up off the ground uh, or how far you are below the surface. You have to keep distoing and hoping that you're hitting your, your survey station. And when you're 112 feet on rope up a pit, it can be really hard to see that little cairn of rocks that you did for the initial drop shot. So our big tapes are the backbone of how we survey these pits. And that's why I say this technique is very specific to open air pits, deep pits, things like this. It does not work well in all situations. If you're surveying big booming virgin cave that's dropping down lots of pits, you're gonna have to do it a different way. Uh, but this is just to kind of show you what we used. Uh, the other thing that's, that's very key is the survey purse or survey pouch. Uh, a foldable clipboard, uh, and then station marking uh, stuff, because a lot of times uh, I'm on rope climbing back up after the survey's been done at the top and done at the bottom, and I have to know exactly where that station is, because frequently I'm surveying from the edge all the way up in that last little bit by myself. Uh, but the tapes are really the key, and, and having these little prussics on them helps out quite a bit. So how do we do this? What, what was sort of the deep ass way? Um, the, the main thing was mapping from the bottom up, if at all possible. And this was something that we learned after doing a bunch of these, because what would happen is we would send somebody down the pit with the dumb end of the tape, and we'd end up in a screaming match about what was going on down there or why there wasn't a direct drop shot, that there was a ledge in the way or that there was something here or we were gonna have to put the station over here. And it became very, very frustrating. And so in sort of an, an air of this, we just all went down to the bottom of the pit so we could all see what was going on and decide we would just do the, do the, uh, the drop shot at the end or, or hang it and do the, figure out the rest from there. And so this has been something that has worked out extraordinarily well. And so we hang this big tape down the pit before everybody goes down, if it's at all possible, sometimes it's not. Uh, and, and again, this, this allows everybody to see what the obstacles are and what does the layout of the pit really look like? Because a lot of times, none of us had been to the pits before. And so we were walking up and just trying to map it right away. Now, again, if you're surveying down a multi-drop system or particularly deep caves or, or, or things like this, for me, surveying rebelay to rebelay has always worked well in those kinds of situations. When I went to Slovenia, we had a deep cave that we discovered while we were over there and we were mapping big pits and, and, and you know, dropping hundreds of meters of depth in a day. Uh, and of course, I couldn't stop everybody and hang a big tape and do my whole technique. And so we, we started mapping rebelay to rebelay. The thing I would just say is keep the shots short uh, so that something does not become unmanageable. It really does not help the survey or anybody to have a larger shot, keep them short. Um, like I said, hang a long fiberglass top or tape from the top going down the pit and tie that off in place. This is really key so that it's, it's attached to where your station was at the top of the pit. And it also gives you a running scale bar down the entire length of that pit. So that when you're sketching and you're climbing back up and you're sketching that, you know, hey, I'm 20 feet off the floor right now. And you also have that dot that you can use to tie all of your plan views together. We'll get into that here in just a little bit. Um, tie all of the survey in the cave into that drop shot. Usually, again, we were surveying the bottom first, so we tie all that in, go to the top. I would tie it into a safe spot. Rest of the team would come up and we'd survey out of the cave if it was if it was a pit that was inside of a cave. Um, and so, like here's here's us uh, surveying at Balcony Sinks a couple of months ago, and Kyle Lasseter right there is doing the job of tying off the tape. And so he's in this case he could see all the way down the the open air pit to where he wanted to do that shot. So he was able to lower that down, get it in place, and then tie that tape off so that it was exactly where it was going to hang, and it was out of the way of the rope, uh, but was it within arm's reach uh, for, for any disto work that I was going to need to do. So if you're descending a pit when we're mapping, this is what it looks like a lot of times, is you kind of have your, your tape going alongside the rope, and your rope just kind of a few feet off to the side there. Uh, you do have to be kind of careful that you don't spin around and let your feet grab it and twist it all around the tape or twist it all around the rope, uh, you can create a real real snag that way. But uh, this has worked well for us in lots and lots and lots of different situations. 
another thing that I'm going to touch on just briefly uh, that, that could be an entire survey talk in and of itself is establishing a zero datum for the pit. Uh, there's lots of different views on this. In fact, you know, Facebook, surprisingly, shockingly to no one, uh, had a big argument about, okay, this is a pit with a high side, a low side. Where is the zero datum? What is the depth of the pit? You can argue till you're blue in the face. Gerald Money would love to discuss this with anybody. Um, I prefer to do the low side or the low saddle of the open air pit if it's a high side, low side situation. That way you're not biasing the data uh, to just have a deeper pit because, oh, I went up on top of this cliff over here and got an additional 60 feet, and now it's a 200 foot deep pit. Uh, I prefer to say, okay, the zero datum is at the low side of that pit, and that cliff adds 60 feet. So it'd be 60 feet above the zero datum if you go to that side of the pit. Uh, and so I just always try to not bias it one particular way. Um, when surveying the pit itself, you want to be sure to collect all your L rubs. And those are your left, right, up, downs that you do at every station. Particularly important is the down distances, because this is what you're going to use later on when you're drafting the map to actually calculate that depth of that floor below the entrance. If you don't have that, all you have is the elevation of your station. And you don't know if that was eight feet up off the floor, if that was hanging over the edge of a 50 foot pit, if it, you know, what was the situation of where that station was? So your down distances when you're pit surveying are particularly important because that also may be where you find your deepest point because sometimes you, you'll get to a place where, okay, it could be one of these six stations is our deepest point. And that's where you need to then go look at your LRED data and see, okay, well, station A3A had the, the largest down and so that now becomes the deepest point in K, in case somebody didn't actually do a shot down to the lowest point in the cave system, if that makes sense. Um, the other thing I want to stress is surface and entrance detail is important too. Caves are not islands. Uh, frequently, geographic context can be important. Uh, if you're at a cave system that has a big spring that's discharging, like Balcony Sink, that's discharging and falling into the pit, you don't want to just draw the opening of the pit. And that just be the only thing that you show of the area around the pit. You want to show, hey, that comes out of a spring, cascades downhill, and then goes into the pit. As well as you may want to show, hey, that spring comes out of the base of the Pennington Formation or whatever the case might be. That's important contextual information you want to try to convey. So, I, you know, Scott House taught me this years ago when I was starting the survey caves was don't stop the map. If you're, it's a horizontal cave, don't stop the map at the drip line, show a little bit of what's going on outside of that. Is it on a big steep embankment? Is it on the side of a cliff? Same with pit maps. Try to show the sinks. Try to show whatever may be going on. You know, uh, large breakdown, the outer edge of the biggest sink, or whatever the case might be. Uh, if you do do this, if you do draw entrance detail, one important thing is on the final map is to be able to clearly label the true opening of the pit. Uh, because that can be lost sometimes especially if you have like a big compound sink where within that big sinkhole, you might have multiple different smaller sinks. You wanna be sure that you clearly label this as the 192 foot pit. Um, as well as I wanted to mention, you know, if there's other caves nearby, you may wanna show where those are in relationship to your pit as well. And so you may wanna leave it a permanent station near the entrance, but then you can tie in that later survey of that other cave because that can be important as well. Okay, moving on to sketching on rope. Um, so general sketching considerations when you're in a pit. Again, if it's possible, sketch from the bottom going up. This is much safer than trying to sketch while you're rappelling. When you're rappelling, you're going to end up having to tie off and then, you know, get an ascender on there, and then you're going to be sketching. Whereas if you sketch as you're just going up, all you have to do is stop climbing and sit back and draw. And so I pr totally prefer to sketch from the bottom going up, which is something that's, that's unusual to a lot of people because I think they think we survey into the cave. Well, on these pits, a lot of times it may be a single day or just a couple days. So take that time and survey from the bottom up. Um, hang the tape, you know, as we talked about, uh, when you're sketching in a pit, your best friends are gonna be a survey pouch, big survey paper, a foldable clipboard and a distance measuring device that's a laser. Now it doesn't have to be a Disto X. If you got a Disto X, fantastic. 
but we've made cheapo Bosch ones work. We've made dumb distos work. We've made all that work, but you're going to need something to be able to accurately survey from that tape to the walls to be able to show the true detail of the pit. When, if you look at old pit maps, a lot of them you'll see are just these like silos going down, just straight walls down into the pit, down to some you know feature at the bottom. No pit looks like that. Even the most silo-like pits like Greenswell in Alabama is not a straight silo. There is detail there. There are, there are alcoves, there are ledges, there are things like this that you wanna be able to accurately depict just as if you were in a horizontal cave. You wouldn't ignore them if they were in a horizontal cave. Therefore, they should not be ignored when you're sketching a, a big pit. Now, uh, some sketchers I know prefer tethers. They like to tether their pencil. They tether their, their protractor. They tether the clipboard. For me, that can get really uh, clustery uh, or complicated. Uh, and so I prefer to not tether, but I always have extra pencils and things like that. Don't always have extra protractors, as Josh knows, but uh, I, may, I usually have extra pencils at least to be able to, if, if I somehow dropped a pencil and, and knock on uh, my desk, uh, that's only happened once that I dropped a pencil. Um, another thing for sketching is I really prefer a chest harness that's really supportive along your spine. Um, and so I use the Petzl Torx, which is basically a very simple strap that goes to one strap in the back to your, the seat of your harness. And what this allows me to do is when I get ready to stop and, and sketch, I can really crank down on that thing and I can create kind of like a hanging hammock seat that then I can sketch in. And thus, I'm not trying to hold myself up to the rope. I'm not trying to like, I, I, I feel much more secure. And then I can just sketch above my seat or my chest harness and my crawl, uh, whatever detail I need to. I can get stuff out of my survey pouch at that point or whatever. So that's something to consider. You know, I've also got an AV chest harness that doesn't have a connecting strap down to the, to the seat harness in the back. I've tried sketching with that, but it was much, much more difficult. If you're somebody who does a bungee up and over to a crawl, you are not gonna like sketching on rope. And so my, my suggestion to you is if you're gonna be mapping deep pits, is to get yourself a, a comfortable, supportive chest harness. And you don't have to break the bank. I think the Petzl Taurus is one of the most affordable uh, chest harnesses out there. It's essentially a, a piece of webbing with a couple of uh, buckles added to it. Uh, and probably the most important thing is take your time. Uh, there is no rush in doing this. Survey with patient friends, uh, <laughs> you know, because they're going to be waiting while you sketch the pit. There's no reason for you to rush this or anything like that. And you don't want to get back home and then be upset about something that you didn't get clearly done. In surveys where I've had to rush, uh, frequently we've had to return for a survey flub or something that occurred because we were trying to get done fast. And so take your time. It's okay to have to do multiple survey trips to, to a cave to be able to get the final map done. Uh, these are the various foldable clipboards that we've used. Uh, the one in the lower right there is what's called a white coat clipboard. Uh, these are made for doctors so they can fold them up and put them in their lab coats uh, and walk around. So they have all sorts of weird medical uh, graphs and charts on them but they're super useful. I now use the one in the upper left-hand corner, which is just a uh, aluminum one that kind of has a, a, a little um, container or, or whatever in the back that you can put other survey pages in. And that's what I use. And I just fold my survey paper in half. Um, now, moving on to, to sort of profile sketching in pits. Uh, again, can't stress it enough, sketch from the bottom going up. Uh, the other thing that this allows you to do is when you have that tape hanging, you have the dumb end of the tape hanging at the bottom of the pit. So as you climb and you get up to 25 or 40, you know, okay, I've climbed 25 to 40 feet and you can just go up your shot that you've drawn on the page from there. And then you disto to those four walls. And so you just, because most pits are going to be formed along a fracture of some sort. And so a lot of times when we're drawing our profiles, We'll do a profile along that main fracture and then we'll cut it perpendicular. So if this is our pit, we're gonna cut it like this and we're gonna cut it like this. Does that make sense? Good, yeah. Nods, yes, thumbs up, okay. Um, I, like I said, you know, stop at various intervals. 20 feet is what I usually do for shorter pits, 50 feet deep for ones that are closer to 300 feet deep, though you can adjust 
for whatever the complexity is or for what you're going to feel comfortable with. You know, if you're just starting out sketching a pit, stop more frequently. Nobody is going to criticize you for stopping every 15 feet instead. But stop at whatever is going to allow you to capture the data at that point and interpolate that data to your previous location that you were at. Um, we're going to shoot our disto to all four walls. Um, now, I will say one thing that we found when we were mapping uh, in balcony sinks was we went there on a very sunny day, and it was also right after a big storm event the next day. So the mist was so high in the pit that we couldn't shoot past the waterfall, and the sunlight was so bright we could not see the disto 125 feet across the pit. And so this is something to consider uh, if you're, if you're a, a laser-based surveyor, is that if you're in bright sunlight, if you get over about 50 feet, it's very hard to see that laser dot. And so we're gonna go back to balcony sinks to finish up the one side of the profile we couldn't get with the, with the waterfall. And we're gonna do that at nighttime <laughs> because it will be much easier to be able to see and shoot across and get that detail. Hey, Ben. Yes. When, uh, when you're drawing, do you, when you're going up the rope, are you drawing all three views or are you drawing your plan views and your uh, profile views on the same trip? Yes, I am. I am. And, and so, you know, a lot of times, and I'm going to, the next slide or next couple slides, we'll talk about the plan views. But yes, I do it all at that. And my plan views that I do where I'm slicing the pit, you know, if this is the shaft of the pit, you know, where I'm slicing it like this, um, I usually do those at whatever station I might be at where I'm stopping anyways to, to sketch detail. So if I'm stopping every 50 feet, I'm probably gonna do a plan view at 50, 100, 150, and then let's say the entrance or something like that. So Ben, when you're saying station, does that mean like, say you're doing every 50 feet. So you do a station is zero and then you go up to 50 and then that's going to be your next station. It's just right there on the rope or, or on the tape. I mean, at 50. Yeah. So, so well, that's from there. Yeah. So that's a good question. So really what I would consider, and, and you can, you can break this up a few different ways. So we've got our station that's at the bottom and we've got our station that's at the top of the pit and we've dropped that tape between the two. Right. And then what I'm doing is I'm climbing at intervals along that and using that to sketch. Now, you could, because that, sta that tape is stationary, you could use that and say, let's say that there's a lead uh, 65 feet up off the ground. Well, you climb up and then you can use that tape as a station because it's in place. It has a fixed point and you could use that to then shoot over with your Disto X and get that orientation over to your, to your lead. And you could use that as your jumping off point because that, and that's where, the tape really becomes critical to these deep pit surveys because if you don't have that tape, you're guessing where that, that spot is. And now you have this floating station that's just amorphous. And so, yes, you can do that. I would not say that I would, each time I stop, that I would consider that a new uh, station. Like I'm not in my book gonna go zero to 50 is 90 degrees. I'm gonna have that one big shot that's like, let's say it's 175 feet and negative 90. And then I'll have my shot drawn on my page and I'll mark off my intervals, you know, 20, 40, 60, 80, whatever. And then when I get up to, to whatever spot I'm going to stop at, I just use that and I've already labeled my intervals and that just helps me kind of do it. So it, it sort of is a, a station and you could use it as a station, but when I'm sketching at these intervals, I don't necessarily depict it that way in the data for the survey. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so as you climb, you know, basically you want to stop and note any features of interest. So this could be geologic contacts, it could be leads, big speleothems that are hanging on the sides of the of the, the pit, anything that's like that that's going to help you depict what that pit actually looks like. Don't just draw the walls. The, the cave is not just walls. There's other stuff there. Again, take your time, uh, especially on your profiles. The profiles are usually going to be the most compelling part of your map. And you don't want to feel like, man, I wish I'd spent 20 more minutes on rope actually getting that than, than you know, trying to get, get done real fast. Um, so moving on to sort of the plan view sketching in pits. Now, I have, when I first started doing this, this work, uh, somebody asked me, well, like, 
what is there even to map in pits? It does, like Ferris Pit doesn't even do anything. You know, what's there to map? Well, there's a giant room at the bottom that's like 35 to 40 feet tall, and it goes about 100 feet or so. So, you know, even the most blind pit, like even if it just goes down to a room that's eight feet across, that still deserves a survey, a shot across it or something like that. Um, and you should still draw the detail there. Uh, and so, you know, your plan views are going to are going to rely on the the same symbology that you've learned with mapping horizontal caves. Breakdown is going to look the same. Speleothems, floor ledges, ceiling ledges, all that kind of stuff is going to be the exact same thing. You know, when you're drawing your plan views. Uh, now, your base of the pit detail and your entrance area detail again are tied together from that big drop shot. So you can separate those on the page and not have to try to draw them on top of each other. I would very much suggest separating those. Don't overly complicate it. You can always piece that stuff together in the drafting part of, of the, the, um, the process, as it were. Um, so again, additional plan views can and should be drawn while sketching the profiles on rope. Uh, some people think of these as cross sections, but this allows drawing the detail in plan view that's on the walls of the pit. And that could be, like we said, leads, speleothems, major ledges, things along these lines. Um, and the plan views should also show the location of that 90 degree shot. So what I'll do when I'm drawing a plan view is I will start out with that dot that is that drop shot. And then I can disto off of that if I've got a disto X and I can draw those actual shots on my page to try to, to flush out like, okay, this wall sticks out more over here or there's this dome over here. And you can use that as your tie. It is critical that you draw that, that drop shot, that, that single dot that represents where your tape is hanging. Because when you draft this, that's going to be your tie between all of these different plan views that are going to be at different orientations. You know, you're, when you get back out of the cave, if you don't have that dot, you're not going to know how much do these overlay. You're not going to have a tie between them. And you're just going to be. Make, making stuff up, essentially. So um, it, it, if that happens, you can still draft your map. The problem is going to be is that you're going to have to just show them in, in relative space. You're not going to be able to show them necessarily in relation to one another, and not show how the, the walls of the pit change as it goes down. Does that make sense? So, so draw that tape. Again, I know most people hate tapes these, this day and age, but they are critical for this stuff. Um, and uh, the other thing that I will say that's very important that can sometimes be lost is as you draw that plan view, if you're drawing that and you're 50 feet up off the floor and now you're 90 feet up off the floor drawing one and now you're 135 feet up off the floor drawing one, write that next to the plan view. You know, even if you just say at 50 or at 85, because when you get outside of the cave, it may look all the same and you may be going uh crap you know like, I, like again you're gonna be you're gonna be forced to to reckon with what you didn't collect on rope kind of thing so does all that make sense to folks and i'm going to show some examples now but but everything making sense okay so this is kind of what it looks like uh and, and so this is this is you know somebody climbing up rope and i drew an imaginary tape there but Let's say that Jason there has climbed up rope and he's now at his first interval. So he's stopped, he's distoed to the, the walls of the longest axis of his profile, which is, you know, this, this one right here. So he's, he's got one profile that's, that's, you know, kind of drawing this wall and this wall. And then he's got his perpendicular one that's sort of the narrow profile. So he's going to draw those. He's going to get out his clipboard. He's going to make those ticks. He's going to draw that intervening a uh, bit of, of the, the profile up and anything that he's seeing on the walls. And then what he can do is he can then use these to then draw, you know, the outline shape, which is going to be his plan view. Now, this is looking up. We would be looking down, obviously, for the plan view. But this is the shape. Oh, boop. This is the shape that he would draw here. Does that sort of make sense to folks? Yeah. I've, so if, if you're just kind of using your L rods to the shape of the cave and, and not orienting them to a specific azimuth, how do you keep that consistent from shot to shot? That's a good question. And so if you've got a disto X, you can, you can 
a lot of times what we have found is that there's not there are pits that do it, but a lot of these caves will stay kind of along one axis going up a pit. So you usually will know like, okay, that's this. But this day and age, we have disto axes. So you can always use that and actually draw those shots if you've got the time. And you can say, okay, to, to this wall is, is, is this azimuth, and you can draw that on your plan view, and it's this to this wall. So you can draw it in true space. Um, there's nothing saying that you can't. And, and again, each pit's going to be different. If you're in a very round pit, you may want to make sure that you get those azimuths because you don't know that this wall is bubbling out a little bit more over here or something along those lines. So um, now I've also done this with a Sunto tandem and a dumb disco. So that can work. The only thing that I would say is be aware of the fact that sometimes you do have steel on your person, you know, your, a rack or something like that. So you just want to be high enough up that you're, you're able to get away from any, any sort of influence. So no, that's a great question. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it's, it's a simple pit where it's just along one joint and it basically stays that all the way up, but it's not always that, that way. So you can absolutely use these as real shots if you need to. Um, so here are some, some notes from some pits to just kind of give you an idea of, of kind of what does this look like on the page. And so you can see here, you know, we went down to the bottom, we surveyed all of our plan view down here, and then you can see like on the profile, I've got my line plot for the, the base of the pit and for the plan view or for the uh, profile view. And then you can see our big shot up and you can see that we've marked off this 20, 40, 60, 80, 1, 120, 140 all the way up so that when I stop at a certain point, I know, okay, this is where it is. I don't have to, to get that out and measure it off or anything like that. And then you can see I've done various plan views. So you can see I kind of use the cross section symbol here. So I'm looking down the pit and then I've drawn it down here and I've drawn this plan view. And then there's my dot, that's my tie of my, of my tape there. And then I've also said plan at 50 feet off floor. Same thing here, plan at 100 feet off floor, and then here's the entrance detail at the very, very top. Um, the black is the is speleothems, and that's something that, that I picked up from Missouri Cavers uh, that I, I like. You know, I'm not an artist. I can draw maps, <laughs> and I can draw caves and things like that, uh, but trying to draw speleothems in an artistic way is not something I'm good at or capable of. And so I find it's much better to just show accurately the shape the sort of relative size of the speleothem uh, than rather to try to show draperies and things along those lines. Another thing that I've drawn here is a shale layer. That's this right here. Uh, and, and that's just something that I noted in, in, you know, while mapping the cave is, oh, wow, there's a shale layer at, you know, 140 up to 142. And so again, using that tape, I can see where that geologic contact starts and then where the next one lies. Um, so, so when we go from, you know, field notes to finished map, it really should not look a whole lot different. And this is something that I preach to people all the time, is that you should do all of your detail and all of your sketching in the cave. Do not add detail outside of the cave. That is, that is fantasy. That is artwork if you're drawing it outside of the cave. I've, I've been sitting at tables before after a big cave trip, and somebody's adding a cross section. You know, it's just like, stop that. That is not, that's not the case. That's what you have in your mind's eye, but that's, that's not accurate. So if you look at this, you'll see that, that really there's nothing that's on my sketch or that's on the final map that's not on the sketch. They should be mirror images of one another. And you can see I've drafted that shale layer in up there at, at the top of the pit there. Uh, sort of another, another example. So like I said, I really prefer to have large paper, eight and a half by 11 paper, so that I can draw the entirety of the pit on the page. We used to use small paper, and small paper is fine. You can use it. You have to do a lot more labeling because what ends up happening is you have to end up chopping the pit up. And this can be a nightmare if you have a really wide pit that's wider than the survey page that you have. And so we take this, and you actually end up having to reorient it into this. And so if you don't have it well labeled, you may put the wrong top on the wrong profile or things along those lines. So that's why I prefer to just have it all on one big piece of paper and it's nice and neat. And that's, that's a hard earned lesson. 
Um, this is so this again, this is this is what that chopped up looks like, and this is the final map. So again, you know, showing this. Uh, dripping domes is another thing. This is a dripping dome over here. You can see that we've got that also in the in the uh, sketch there as well. Um, this is another one. So this one you can see uh, we've got nice big profiles here. We've got our, our, our cross section line showing where we did our plan views. And then here we've got our base of pit. We've got 40 feet up the pit, at 80 feet up the pit. And then we've got our entrance detail down here. Uh, now, again, you know, they may not all be perfectly stacked on one another, but you're hanging on ropes. So the main thing is just make yourself enough clear notes that you can decipher this when you get out of the cave. But uh, this is where taking your time is invaluable because you don't want to just be rushing and not have labeled a plan view and then you don't know where it fits. Uh, another another um, uh, pit, just again to kind of show that Drawing that line plot on the profile is critical. You don't want to have a line plotless profile. You need to show where those stations are and where they are relative to one another in true space. Uh, one thing I will point out here is, is we've got a bolt right here and we've got two bolts down here. And so that's, that's another thing that we're wanting to show when we're, when we're drawing uh, uh, maps or sketching pits is where any sort of rigging is. And I'll show this kind of in the finished maps, but this is something you want to draw when you're doing when you're doing this. I use little X's. So there's another one there, you know, down here, here's a traverse out to one and then down a big canyon kind of thing. So these are things just to consider when you're mapping is, is don't just go draw the silo of the pit and that's it. You, you want to, you really, you want to make a map that doesn't have to be redone at some point. We have plenty of bad maps out there. Uh, that we end up redoing or whatever, don't 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 make one this day and age. There's no reason to. Um, the other thing I want to mention is don't be afraid to break up complex areas into more digestible pieces. You don't have to map it all in one fell swoop. Um, do what you can handle. If you're getting overwhelmed, call it a day. This is massive well, and the colored boxes show individual trips that this was mapped on. The individual pieces of these awesome big profiles that we have were sketched on as many as four different trips. And then because we had those line plots, we could piece all that together for the final map. And so, you know, on one trip we went in the second entrance and mapped this, this area over here. And, you know, Josh did this section up here and I did this section here. And then another trip, we did this big hall and this little chunk here. So it's okay to break that up. You don't have to try to do this in one fell swoop. Again, this, this really just comes down to taking your time and doing it right. So, so don't be afraid to, to you know, and, and sometimes we go back to caves and we do cartography cleanup. So we've drafted the map up and we are missing something or we don't have this particular thing. And you can go back in, as long as you have your stations drawn, uh, you can go back in and add, add detail as you need to. You know, we did that with some of, these, uh, these natural bridge complexes that are in, in Massive Well. You know, we didn't get those quite as well as we would have hoped. And so we went back in later and did that. Okay, so moving on to sort of, you know, the bells, whistles, and other map ephemera. So these are like the little things that you add to make your map look really cool and sexy and, and you know, everybody think that you're a badass or whatever kind of thing. So uh, this, is, this is really gonna be drafted maps. This is not sketches, so I've shown the sketches and the unpolished side. This is kind of the, the uh, polished side where, where you know, you're making it all kind of put together here. So we talked a little bit about rigging on maps and trying to show that. Uh, this is important from, you know, it's somebody's going to a cave and they're going to be trying to figure out how much rope to, to bring. That's important. Now, I am not a fan of saying, oh, it's a 112-foot pit, 150-foot rope needed. That's, that's not something I'm a fan of because everybody rigs differently and what works for one person may not work for another person. So I prefer to just show what the pit depth is and show maybe what rigging's there and let the person kind of do the math for themselves. Um, here's a couple of different examples. Uh, here's a, a bolt traverse that was done in a cave uh, over to what we thought was a really good lead, but it wasn't. Uh, over here, you can see you know, we're rigging off a tree coming in the cave. There's a bolt right there with a relay. You can go down this way, or you can go down this way to another bolt and then down. I try to show the biggest drops as I can, the biggest free sections of those drops. 
And again, this is another thing that you can, you can uh, argue with Gerald until you're blue in the face is where does a pit stop and end? Uh, but that's, that's what I like to show on, on uh, my maps is just drop portion if at all possible. Uh, just another example, uh, one other thing that rigging can help you do is sort of, if you have a complex cave like this, where it's really domes and pits stacked on top of each other and superimposed on one another, it can help you identify the same pit in multiple profiles. So we have a 45 foot pit here, here's the same pit here, uh, and, and you know we have an 89 foot pit here. Oh, there's the same 89 foot pit there. Kind of thing. And so uh, showing the bolts can, can be really helpful. Now, one other thing I did on this that, that's a little hard to see is over here says old bolt. Now that was a bolt that we did not use. Uh, that, was, that was a very, very ancient bolt, but we wanted to acknowledge that it was there. You'll notice our rope does not go up to it. Now, that's just a thing that, that I like to show if it's there, it, it still has a hanger or something like that, but um, you know, we show the bolts that we used or set. Uh, talking about surface features, you know, we talked about the caves are not an island, you know, and so you would hate to go to this, this awesome entrance and just draw two little circles and start the map from there and like not talk about, oh, the 25 foot waterfall that crashes into the pit kind of thing. So you want to show, oh, there's a spring just 40 feet up slope of the pit. Uh, now there's a, there, you know, there's a time and a place and, and each pit is different. And so if the spring is 500 feet away and the cave's only 80 feet long, maybe you don't need to show that spring, but you maybe just show the stream bed coming into your pit. So each, each case is, is different. Um, this is a, a group of caves in the Smokies and they were almost right on top of one another, but they did not actually go over one another. But because of this, I wanted to really show the entrance sinkhole specifically so that a person could find the various caves. And so you can see here, we have a service channel with flow coming in and that flow happens to go down calf cave number two. But to the north, just underneath this big ledge is calf cave one. And then we're still showing where the walls for these various caves are and things like that. You can also add some nice, you know, big, there was a giant tree that had fallen in and you know, tree was like four or five feet in diameter, so it was a major feature in the sinkhole. Um, mirror image well, big big pit down in, in Marion County. Again, surface detail. Uh, one of the things I really wanted to do with this was there was a couple of leads on the surface that that had airflow, had noticeable airflow. Uh, these were even talked about in the narrative and may even be designated as a different cave, I believe. But if you look uh, at the at the final map, that area of the sinkhole is not over any known part of the cave there. And so that's why it's important to show like, oh, even though it's, it's right there, and if you looked at just a plan view, you might think, oh, wow, that's right on top of the cave. Well, that part of the cave is, you know, 180 feet lower. So it, it may be a different part of the cave. It may be a different cave entirely. Uh, you can also see that there's a small stream here coming out from underneath this boulder and sinking into the sinkhole there. So things like this are, are important to show. Uh, the sinkhole down in Marion County, big, nice open air pit, tag classic, um, has a, a big stream that comes in and then cascades down a series of waterfalls making its way into the cave. Well, I would totally be remiss if I just eliminated that river from, from the map. And so we drew that up here. It also had like a spring house that was up there and a bunch of trees that had fallen over it. And so we drew all that coming into the, into the pit there to kind of show what does the character of the cave really look like. Um, mapping geology in pits is also something I'm a, I'm a big fan of. And you have to be careful. You got you to work with what knowledge that you have and, and can accurately depict. If you don't know the difference between sandstone and limestone, have somebody show you. Um, don't just be, you know, making inferences that you don't really have supporting evidence of. For instance, the Hartzell Mon Eagle is a very classic pit forming contact that we see here in TAG. There are hundreds of caves formed at the Hartzell Mon Eagle contact. But we may also want to show other minor units, uh, shales, shaley limestones, chert, churdy limestones, or sandstone lenses, things like this. Other things that could be helpful would be faults, tilted bedding, an obvious dip to the cave. Uh, you know, over in Cumberland County, we sometimes get caves that follow dip. Well, we would certainly want to try to show that if we can on the map, because that tells you something about how the cave formed that just a standalone profile is not going to show. So just some examples of this. Uh, the examples that I, I, I kind of brought for the first bit tonight 
are these are from the Calf Killer Valley, which uh, you know there's thousands and thousands of caves over in that area, and uh, these are all up on one mountain. And you can see that we we have the sandstone, then a thin limestone, then a thick layer of shale, and all the pits start right below that shale. Uh, we we show this both in cross section view and on profile view, and we also show it on all of our little cross sections up here at the top of the pit. Um, and here it is in, in real life person. Now, if we go just a few hundred feet away, we come to France Mountain Pit. You can see we have a sandstone, a limestone, and a thick shale layer, and then a big pit. We see this exhibited again in It's a Pit. Uh, and if we go way up valley to, to the headwaters of the calf killer, we can see we get sort of a modified version of this. We have sandstone, a thin layer of shale, a thin layer of limestone, and a thinner layer of shale. So that, that sequence has changed just a little bit. And this tells us things about the depositional environments that those rocks were initially laid down in. And so even though it may seem like, okay, well, you know, why are we worrying about showing this? It can show things across distance that may be important for how the caves in that particular area form. Um, here's an example from the Ozarks. This is a shaley limestone on top of a pure, or a, this is a churdy limestone on top of a pure limestone. And one thing that was kind of neat was, you know, here's the entrance pit, which is all in that churdy limestone, and it just sort of perches on that pure limestone. But as you go through the cave, it actually changes where it is. And you can see, you know, we show this here, where the floor is that pure limestone, but our ceiling is that churdy limestone. And this is another little, little thing here. This was drawn uh, by Dylan Freeberger, who is, who is on the, on the uh, call tonight, which is speleothems on the wall. And this is something you can show. It takes a little bit more artistic uh, um, prowess or whatever you want to call it to do that. Uh, we recently did this on another cave that, that was a spectacular show cave, but all of the speleothems were on the walls of the cave, and it was a hundred foot deep pit, and we wanted to certainly not, you know, eliminate the 80 foot tall, you know, column that's in the cave uh, that just happens to be on the wall, and so this is something else that you can add but it takes a little bit of an eye because it sort of does, it can look to, to somebody maybe like um, those formations are floating in space. But I feel like it, it, it really kind of shows uh, nicely, you know, where you might have certain isolated groupings of speleothems. Uh, this is Greenswell. Uh, and one interesting thing about Greenswell is it starts at the Hartzell and goes down through the Mon Eagle. And then it perches on a series of chert layers that are down here at the lower end of the cave. And then the cave sumps as it's just gotten through that churdy limestone. But this had other, other units. And so you can see here on this map, I included this lithologic explanation, which talked about all the different types of symbols. And so this is important because you may or may not be using the only symbol that is there for a shaley limestone, which is also known as an argillaceous limestone. Uh, and so you want to maybe have a little box where you explain, here's what my geologic symbols mean. Um, another thing is depict, depicting multiple levels in pits. This is frequently something where we have a pit that goes down to something, turns a corner, and goes right back underneath itself. Um, and so ways that I deal with this, and different people deal with this in different ways, is I use, I use grayed out lines of the, the various levels. So really, this shows itself on the plan views. And so you can see here we've got an upper level plan, a middle level plan, and a lower level plan. And so starting from the bottom up, we show where that lower level plan is in relationship to the middle level plan. And then I combine the walls from this level and this level, and I bring them over to the next level. And so if you look here, you can actually see there's that little uh, sort of tail sticking out there. And, and this allows you to show where things are in relationship to one another. If we didn't have this and we just tried to show this in one view, the deepest part of the pit would be obscured by the detail of, of the upper portions of the cave, and you wouldn't even be able to see what's going on in the deepest part of the cave. Now, the other thing I've done on this map is, you know, I label this upper level, middle level, lower level. I also show on the profile view, where is the upper level, middle level, and lower level, so that somebody can correlate these between one another. Here's another example. This is, uh, this is another Cumberland County pit. Uh, and so you notice as we go from bottom to top, that lower level wall gets more and more complex. But as we work our way down, now you just have this section that's underlined. You go down one more, now you just have this little section and so on and so forth. Again, first level, second level, third level, fourth level. Again, on the pit, first level, second level, third level, fourth level. 
I also label the pits. So this is a 68 foot pit, 47 foot pit. This is a 123. I label those as well on the, the plan views because I have been in vertical caves that had maps that were great looking maps, but didn't label where the pits were. And we spent two hours trying to find the damn top of the pit that led to the bottom of the cave, even though we had a map of the cave. Uh, so it's important to, to, to show things both on the plan view and the profile. Again, Massive Whale, I'm going to zoom in here. Massive Whale really was a, a brain twister uh, or mind bender uh, for us because it had just everything. It was a really, really complex cave. And so like in this area, for instance, I had to do a solid gray line for my upper level, and I had to do a dashed gray line for my lower level. And so I offset in my lower level to one side and offset my upper level to one side. Well, down in this area, this southwest area, we actually had a passage that started out as an upper level and then became a lower level in a maze area. And so that's where these different symbols can become important to you. And same thing here where we kind of did a backwards version where we offset the upper level detail here from the pit because the bulk of the pit's detail was really in that lower level. So it made more sense for us to offset the upper detail. Again, every map is different. You're gonna have to do what works for you. But this is just some things that have worked for me uh, in trying to depict some of these, these pits here in TAG. And with that, I am done. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take any questions. Nice job, man. Yeah, thank you. Do we have any questions for Mr. Ben Miller? I know uh, Chris and I were asking during <laughs> the presentation. It's all good. I'm happy to take any questions. I got one. Um, uh, I was wondering, you know, that your your like pit surveying technique uh, with the whole tape and really being really specific about it going down. Um, at what point do you think that that is like super necessary? Um, like, I don't think I'm very good at surveying pits, but you saw what we did in uh, in Logston. And now looking at this, I'm thinking that we didn't do it right. Um, <laughs> so I, I was just wondering what you thought about that. Yeah, I mean, it, and, and each situation is unique. I mean, like I said, you know, it's if, if you're surveying, you know, if you were going into Logston, uh, you know, and you were exploring and it's a virgin cave, you know, you can't really make everybody stop. It's like, hold on, I'm going to hang a tape and now I'm going to go to the bottom and climb this. 25 foot pit and things like that. For me, the, the breakover point is probably in like the, I don't know, 75 foot deep range. It's at whatever point do you feel like that, that you can accurately depict that. And so on a 75 foot pit, I would probably feel comfortable being halfway up and being able to say, okay, I can clearly see the bottom. I can draw up to here. And then I've got the top of the pit just 30 feet above me. So if, if you're really only like one interval of climbing, you know, that you would, at where you would stop, then I don't know that you have to do that. Uh, this has worked well in deep pits where it, you know, and we started this, you know, started this technique in 2002 when distos were like something that really, you know, super fancy people brought that, you know, stayed in a Pelican box basically and never came out. Um, and so we developed this then. And, and like I said, it doesn't work for every type of situation, but that's kind of my rule of thumb is like, if you get over sort of one interval, which, which for me is, you know, probably in the 20 to 30 foot range, uh, you know, so times double, you'd be, you know, looking in the 40 to 60, 70 foot, foot range, then I would start thinking about it. If you find a 120 foot pit, I would try to do something along these lines. But again, you know, I, every situation is unique and you just got to do what's going to work for you in, in the cave that you're working, working on. Any other questions? Okay. Well, if there's not any other questions, we can definitely stop the record.